This is the School Success Podcast, a podcast for school leaders to learn from other school leaders what's working and what's not, and to get inspiration and encouragement, as well as strategies to grow school enrollment, connect with families, retain teachers, recruit teachers, and everything in between. You guys are heroes, and I cannot thank you enough for pouring into this next generation that's coming behind us. My goal is you will take at least one thing away from every episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. Please enjoy the School Success Podcast. Hey, School Success Makers. Today, we're joined by my new friend, Luke, who's the head of school at his Christian school in the great, amazing horse capital of the world, city of Ocala, Florida. And I say that because that is where I was originally born and partially raised until my family moved to Alaska. But I dive into that a little bit in today's episode. But this one is awesome. We dive into some really good content that I know you guys are gonna love and actually be able to take back to your school to make it better than it is right now, which is obviously my goal and vision for this podcast. So I'll stop talking. We'll get into the episode here in just a few moments. So please enjoy this next episode of the School Success Podcast. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the School Success Podcast. I'm your host, Mitchell Slater. I'm joined by a new friend out of amazing, beautiful, and I'll explain why, Ocala, Florida, right in the central part of Florida. And it's Luke Butler, who is the head of school of Redeemer Christian School, and they're growing. They are movers and shakers there in Central Florida, and they're doing some awesome things. And the reason I did a huge shout out to Ocala, that was actually where I was born and raised before my family uprooted our lives and moved all the way to Alaska. But Ocala is where I saw a family that lives, cousins, and my grandma, who's 95 or 96. Gosh, what is it? I think it's 97, actually. Oh, my goodness. She's getting so old. She's amazing. Uh, but that's where I did a lot of my growing up. So this one is kind of just near and dear because they're in the city I grew up in. But I don't want to take any uh, thunder away from Mr. Luke, so I'll pass it off to him to introduce himself. So, Luke, welcome to the podcast, sir. Thanks for having me, Mitchell. I appreciate you coming on. Man, I love it. So, uh, I would love to know, since you know, being in Ocala, how long you've been there, specifically in Ocala, not talking about the school part, mm -hmm. and what do you like to do for fun there? So, it's been a while since I've lived there. I moved out of there in 04 to when we moved to Alaska. But how, what's kind of your big thing you like to do there in, in Florida? Yeah, so I, I was actually born in Orlando and went to school in Gainesville. And so I would drive through Ocala. Uh, didn't even know Redeemer existed or anything here. But my wife and I and my three children, we've been here for 10 years now. This is our going into our 11th year. Um, and honestly, one of the things I love doing in Ocala is riding my bike. And uh, there's, there's uh, trails. There's a paved trail that goes... I don't know, 30 something miles across the county. And uh, I will push myself on a Friday afternoon and try to try to make it to I-75 and back to my house. Uh, love doing that. And then, you know, really the, the beautiful thing is all of my family lives pretty much within about an hour and a half of here. So um, my my kids get to see their uncles and grandparents. And that, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing as well. I love it, man. I... Ocala is so it's funny when we went back after I got married, which I got married when we were still living in Alaska. We moved to we finally visited Florida for the first time with my wife. We visited Ocala. Uh, I talked about it because I was like, Oh, I'm from the South because she's from North Carolina. So she always said she was from the South. And I was like, Well, I'm from the South too. And she's like, No, it's it's not the same. You know, Northern Florida. She said, Maybe I'll give you that benefit if yeah. you're in Northern Florida. But yeah. she visited it and she goes, You know what? This feels more southern than i thought it would be being in this this part and she actually loved how beautiful it was which i didn't remember how beautiful it was i was 11 when i moved to alaska we're going through i love all the oak trees and the moss and everything just so i don't know it felt like home even though so we live in port st Lucie, where there's so many palm trees which i love palm trees but after a while mm -hmm. i love a good oak tree pine tree yeah. and all that so yeah. Well, Cal is beautiful, that horse country and everything out there, horse capital of the world with that new center that just went in Ocala. You know that big center, right? Yeah, the uh, yeah, World Equestrian Center. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that is half a mile from the house I grew up in. We wow. lived in a neighborhood right right in front, literally right in front of it, um, a half a mile down that road. We lived in So when I went in, my dad sent me a video, and this is totally off topic. Everybody's like, what are these guys talking about on this podcast? But 
that went in and I was like, this is so random, like this ginormous equestrian center right yeah. in the Ocala, but it's yeah. Yeah, we that that's what struck us the first time we came here for our interview was just the beauty, uh, the trees, the oak trees, horse farms, uh, rural roads. Yeah, it, it it is a beautiful place. There are no mountains, but there are lots of other things here. So. Yeah, I wish it was if it was on the water or close, super yes. close to the beach. Perfect. Yeah. I think the perfect place. Yeah, you know. yeah. You you would you would have to beat people away from moving here because that. Yes. Yeah. So, totally agree. Well. You've been there for a, over a decade now at Redeemer? Is, yeah, we're just starting our 11th year. So. Wow. So I would love to hear what was it like when you first started to kind of where it's at now in terms of, you know, maybe the culture of the school, the growth of the school, kind of like give me that 10-year that view that you've seen. Sure, sure. So it's a beautiful thing. And I'm a history guy. So I love the history of this school. Before I got here, uh, the school was established in 1999 by um, the folks from Good Shepherd Presbyterian Church. Uh, and a family who had donated the land to the church and said uh, they were so affected by Christian school for their kids. In fact, I believe they became Christians because of the, the Christian school that they sent their kids to. Well, they gave the land to the church and the church said, we'll, we'll, we'll put a Christian school on here. One of these days, it'll be a K-12 Christian school. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I got here in 2012, um, we were a K-8 school and we were about 180 kids. And uh, the school uh, board asked me, they said, hey, how about you, you plant a high school? I said, well, how hard can that be? Sure, let's do that. <laughs> and uh, we all joke about that now. But, but uh, two years later, um, we opened our ninth grade, first class of six kids. And uh, at this point today, 10 years later, there's 125 kids enrolled in the high school for next year uh, and 500 and almost 530 for the entire school. So um, the dream of the Lyles who gave the property, uh, it has come to fruition. There is a K-12 Christian school here that's a mission school that reaches uh, all kinds of kids in Marion County, Ocala for Jesus. And it's a wonderful thing. Just an aside, I actually taught two of the Lyles' grandchildren at my Christian school in Orlando, but I had no idea the connection because obviously that was 20 years ago. Um, and so it's it's wonderful how it comes full circle that I I, I saw the legacy of what they were doing in Orlando with their, their grandchildren, and now I get to be part of that legacy here in Ocala. I love that. And are they still alive to see nope, this? They are with the Lord, so yeah. Okay. Yep. Man, I was wondering if there was any family still going to be like, wow, like yeah. this happened. Yeah, their, their son, I've, I've, I've talked with their son and um, met with him a couple of times and he's real excited about what's going on here. But um, yeah, they have they have passed on to be with the Lord. Okay. So are you guys connected to a church that is like a giving, sponsoring church? Are you kind of all independent? Yeah, we are a ministry of Good Shepherd Presbyterian Church and we are, we are, we're, we're kind of a freak show, if you will. Um you know, it, it, school leaders that are listening to this, some of them may understand this. Uh, normally, when you have a church that, that plants a school, the church tends to be larger than the school. Maybe the school is a, a subset or a category of the of the church, a ministry of the church. And we are that. We are a ministry of Good Shepherd Presbyterian Church. But uh, Good Shepherd, uh, I think their average attendance is between 120 and 130 uh, wow. a Sunday. And we are, you know, three times that. And um, and we have we have probably one of the most wonderful relationships with the church that any school could have. They are all in and all about who we are because we're their largest ministry. They concentrate on us. They care for us. They don't give us a lot of money because they don't have a lot of money, and that's okay. Um, to be honest, I think it's it's probably a strength of our relationship. That that's the case. So, man, and I, I'm assuming then everything is the funding is basically all from tuition. That's the main way that the school. It is, it is. And that's another um, beautiful thing. When I got here, our operating budget was 100% from tuition. Um, so we weren't raising money to keep the lights on. Um, and that is still the case 10 years later that we are 100% operating on tuition. And that, that allows us to do the other things that we wanna do in terms of fundraising, in terms of uh, capital campaigns. But also it allows us, 
allows us to be responsible with hiring the best teachers and and trying to pay uh, competitive salaries and giving competitive benefits. Because if you're teaching children, you you got to put the best people in front of them. And yeah. so that's what we're trying to do. Now, you mentioned your school being um, like a mission school. Does that mean you no know, the parents and the kids not required to be Christians um, to go to school, correct? That is correct. And it's that's an exciting, scary proposition. It's exciting in the sense that we are distinctively Christian. Um, we, we hire our teachers and our staff all must profess uh, faith in Christ and have a, a mature, developed understanding of, of theological underpinnings of education. Um, but our parents and students, and, and I do all the tours, and it's one of the things I do, uh, all the admissions tours, and I did about uh, 270 this last cycle. So I met everybody in Ocala uh, this last year. Um, but we tell them, listen, we're a distinctly Christian school. We approach our content from a Christian world and life view. Um, we believe all truth is God's truth, but we are invitational in the sense that we invite people who love Jesus to bring their kids here and people who don't love Jesus to bring their kids here. We just tell them we're, we're not going to compromise our theology about where we stand, but we are going to create an invitational um, culture in which people can come and learn about the gospel uh, through the educational process. And so it, it, it's wonderful. Um, I, I, I don't know if I would ever go back to any other model of Christian education mm. if given the chance. I, I really love this model because we see it work. We see kids come to faith in Christ. We see parents come to faith in Christ. And um, as long as we are mission focused, which uh, is one of the things that I think you and I have talked about, as long as we keep our mission focused, I think we're going to be in a good spot. Yeah. And do you see, I guess, I don't know if there's a way of knowing numbers in a way of like going, oh, this many families, when they do the tour, they say, or they fill the application out, they say that they are Christian or not. Do you have like a a ratio of who does who is and who isn't that goes to the school you know um no I, I will the honest answer is no we don't keep a ratio of that and and in some sense i don't even know how helpful that would be because i think culturally speaking i would say the number of tours i do i would say it's probably between 20 and 40 percent make some indication of a, of a faith commitment whether it's a spoken faith or uh, or uh, uh, just a church attendance which again, we we would understand that doesn't necessarily you know correlate with faith, but it could. Um, but I would say, just judging by what I see here and experience, I'll bet it's probably somewhere around 30, 35 yeah. percent uh, of folks that that believe and that attend a, a church. Um, it may be more, um, but we we actually plan for less. We, we assume very little of a faith commitment when they walk in the door. And when we discover they have a faith commitment, then we obviously, you know, want to foster that and, and, and grow that. But it, we assume none. And so we started a good invitational place. Okay. We've had guests, uh, Christian school guests that are all the different models, you know, yeah. some that they have to have to profess the, um, Oh my gosh, if we're spacing the word of what they call that covenant. I think it's covenant church. Yeah, 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 yeah. covenant school. Uh, we've had it all, and I, I see both sides of it. I love, I, I would say my my heart would probably go more with your your model just because that's what I picture in my head of like, well, we need to, again, I see both sides, but like we need to be the church to these you know, yeah. kids as well. And so I, I love yeah. that. Obviously, that has, cha of course, challenges that yeah. Oh, yeah. come with it, but yeah. I, I love that model. So I think it's good, but we've had it, we've interviewed. Christian schools now from all over the country and it's funny how like how many different ones are out there and the size difference and everything which is some yeah. of the there's one I interviewed just yesterday he uh um golly what was it, it was in, right outside Atlanta and I think they're their covenant so they had to have the requirement and then they had over a thousand students right there yeah. outside Atlanta yep. I'm like oh yep. my gosh like that's yeah. crazy <clears throat> yeah yeah but all the models have have their challenges but they're all as long as you understand your identity as a school, and as long as your staff and your faculty understand that identity and say, you know, as our as our model goes, you know, I remind the staff all the time and the faculty, hey, you can't assume any faith commitment by any of your students. If you find one, rejoice in it and, and foster it. But if you assume nothing, then you, you're speaking to an audience and assuming nothing, and that's probably a healthy place to be. Mm -hmm. um, We've had we've had uh, young people. We had one in the middle school 
uh, three, four years ago. And I knew that that there was, I don't think there was a faith commitment that was expressed by the family when they did the tour, but he's sitting in Bible class and the Bible teacher taught a passage. I don't even remember where it was. I think that would have been, if seventh grade had been Genesis. And he raised his hand and with just this awe and wonder on his face, he goes, I didn't know that was in the Bible. And I don't even remember what it was, but it was a genuine awe of the word of God. And it was really cool. And it, that happens, you know, here and there um, where kids, they'll look around and they'll say, I wonder if anyone else knows that that was in the Bible. Or I wonder if I'm the only one. But a lot of the times we just we continue to remind kids, hey, don't don't be afraid to ask questions because that is a really healthy place for kids to be. And so. That's that's what we try to foster, that kind of invitational environment. Well, I can relate. I the, my pastor will suddenly say stuff and be like, My <laughs> gosh, I have never heard that before. And it's it's funny because I have read the Bible from cover to cover. That was one thing I did in high school. Was like my mom was like, Oh, I think you need to do this, and I did it. But there's parts of the Bible you just like kind of just yes, you're reading it, but you're not comprehending really what yeah. you're reading. So there'll be something come up in a sermon, I'll be like, What I have never heard that story before, and it just kind of like shocks you because it's <clears throat> It's a big book. There's a lot going on, and God yeah. obviously speaks to you in different, uh, different seasons with different stuff. So very cool. So uh, that's a probably perfect segue into kind of that first section I like to talk about, which is some challenges you guys are up mm -hmm. against. And I know you mentioned a few before we started recording, but kind of what are those challenges you guys got, and how are you combating those right now? Well, if I were writing my memoir of the last ten years, which I'm not, but if I were, I would probably entitle it "Growing Pains." Um, you know. When I got here, uh, we were 180 kids and I was the administrator. I was, you know, the head of school, uh, but I had no principals, no divisions, nothing. It was me. So I made all the decisions, which, you know, is a challenge. You know, what am I, what if I'm wrong? You know, what if I mess up? Well, you know, those are all great questions. And I did, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to continue doing that. Um, you know, my school board was leaning a little bit more operational, though they, they started to lean more strategic as I got here, which has been a refreshing uh, evolution for them. So they've, they've stayed out of the day-to-day -day stuff and allowed me to do it. Um, but as we grew, it was, a, it was a great process. And the growth was organic, unplanned. Um, some would say by default, um, you know, we've had a steady growth. I think we've had one year of flat enrollment in 10, and that was the COVID year. And we expected that. We actually expected a loss and we didn't get a loss. Um, but all of the um, conditions over the last 10 years have been uh, of growth. And Florida is a unique position. You've got a, a, a voucher system. You've got, um, I think, public schools um, just body in terms of their, um, there's some really good ones. And then there's some ones that are struggling a little bit. Um, but I think even the political climate, and the cultural climate, and all that, but the growing pains from going from one administrator with 180 kids and no high school to now I've got um, really three divisions. I've got a preschool and an elementary and an upper school. So I've got division directors for those three. I've got a dean of students. I've got a business manager. Um, you know, I, I've got a curriculum coordinator. Uh, you know, I've got an IT director. And I've got, a, I've got a team. And so my mentor who shared with me said, Luke, as you grow your school, as God grows the school, you know, instead of um, managing and shepherding and overseeing 30 faculty members, that was about what we had when I got here, you're going to really only oversee five to seven people and they're going to oversee everybody else. And so I, I told my wife this the other day. I said, when I got here, I made all the decisions. Now, 10 years later, I make very few of the decisions, day-to-day -day decisions, but I'm still responsible for all of them. Yeah. So that that's a, you know, there's a cultural part of it because, you know, I like what I like and I have opinions about everything. That's, you know, that, that's maybe dangerous, but, but I'm also not a micromanager because I know that if God brings me good people, I've got to cut them loose and let them do their job. They're qualified. Frankly, they're more qualified than I am to do what they're doing. That's why they're in that position. So um, one of the personal things for me has been letting go and, and allowing the people that God has brought here to do their work. And, and almost always that is the best idea <laughs> because they're here for a reason. 
and I was I was part of their hiring process, and I know how good they are because they're better than I'll ever be in that position. Mm-hmm. So, personally, the growing pain of of growing, expanding, but also being really sort of helpless in some sense, and then having to allow the processes that I've set in place and the people that I put in place to do their job. Because if I'm still trying to micromanage those, I won't keep those people long. I wouldn't stay long if I were micromanager. The second thing is as a, an organization, as a school, we still have a few of those founding families. I mean, we're 23 years old, 24 years old as a school or 23 years old going into this year. And there's still some families who had kids here the first year the school was. Yeah. You're talking probably five or six families like that. But then you have families that are coming in that didn't even live in Ocala when the school was found. We have, I mean, Probably, I'll bet we've got 25 families that moved from out of state that, that are new in the last three years. And so um, there's a there's a, a cultural shift. And I, I mentioned it before, you know, our mission is, you know, to serve students through a rigorous, biblically integrated program of instruction, instruction, teaching them to live in community with excellence and grace. And, you know, that that mission was a mission that we started with in 99 and we still have today. And I pray we'll have in 50 years from now. And so we have to look at that mission and say, that's who we are. We're, we're a mission school, but we are mission focused in the sense that even though we are no longer 180, we're 530, we have to continue to be true to that mission because a mission drift is, is something that especially educational institutions are, are very susceptible to. And so, you know, I come here, I hear the story of the Lyles, I hear the story of the Strawbridges, you know, Ted was the founding pastor. Um, I hear what they were aiming at, and I said, I want to continue aiming at that. And that w- one of these days when I step down and someone else takes my place, I'm going to tell that person, say, keep aiming at this, because that it's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about the Strawbridges or the Lyles, it's about Jesus. And if we keep aiming at that, we're going to be okay. But as we grow, that's that's a difficult thing. And it segues into, I think, one of the other things we'll talk about is hiring. When you're hiring teachers, and I think every school leader would probably say this, doesn't matter if it's public, private, charter, Christian, you, if you don't hire the, the best people for the position, you know, I think uh, good to great said it, you get the right people on the bus, you know where the bus is going. Um, that's that That is an increasingly difficult challenge for us is finding people who understand Christian education, who understand the mission of what we're trying to do, understand that we are a mission school. You use the word mission two different ways that way. That's an increasing challenge. And that's something that I think over the next five to 10 years, that's going to be the thing. Mm. Uh, Buildings, money, uh, enrollment, I think those are going to, in some sense, take care of, of themselves. It's going to be the hiring the right people to do the right things and we obviously have seen all across the country you know the 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 mass exodus of teachers that we keep hearing about and then i know christian schools from hearing from the guests we've have on that one of their challenges they've mentioned is the the competitive salary compared Mm -hmm. to the district Mm -hmm. that they're in Mm -hmm. they're like typically i think all the ones i've talked to they cannot match what the district's paying but they try and make up for it and other things like discount for their children to go to the school there mm-hmm. and different things to try and add but so that's already a challenge they're they're facing for that but then just trying to find teachers in general and then obviously they have to be christian so that adds another level to it so yeah like how how has that been for you guys and have you well, had to have you lost teachers that you've had to hire recently too now uh, our retention rate um thank thank the lord our retention rate of staff and faculty is pretty high i i can't give you exact number but i'm estimating probably in the last um five years uh since high school came fully on board we've probably been uh mid 90s in terms of our retention wow. um, and there's been some years where it's been higher than mid 90s um we have been reasonably competitive and i think in our market even though we're uh probably 10 to 15 percent lower in terms of the actual salary with our public school compatriots um we have a, a fairly rigorous matching benefits package, um, insurance, um, dental, vision, retirement, things like that. The intangibles that we offer are mission-driven focus, 
I think because we have smaller classrooms, because we have a, a tight knit community, community is one of our core values. People love coming to work. Um, they wake up in the mornings generally knowing that God's called them to be in their classroom or to be at their their desk station in the office or to be as an administrator. And I think that uh, and I think even secular companies would would argue that if if an employee is bought into the culture and the mission of what you're trying to accomplish, that that makes up for very often a little bit of money that may be left on the table because we're not able to pay it. With all that said, my board has been very, very clear. They said, we, we want to get to 100% or, or more of what this county pays uh, in, in terms of what we're actually paying our salary. So, uh, you know, raising tuition, again, as we talked about, our model is 100% tuition based. You know, uh, do we have to come off that at some point, you know, to keep things affordable, but also to pay our teachers well? Well, strategically speaking, we're talking about all those things and we're trying to do that. I actually think that that we can continue to push our tuition up gradually and to be able to, to compensate our teachers well. Um, I think we're going to get there. And I think I think we have to get there because in five to 10 years, you know, a lot of the teachers that are here that are in their 40s and 50s, they're going to be near retirement. And, you know, I look at it, I'm 51. Who's going to take my place? Who's going to take their place? And so replacement and succession, it's not just for head of school, it's for every position on campus. So we're thinking about those things. There are some great colleges out there, Covenant College, Calvin College, you know, um, Dort, uh, Wheaton. There's some colleges, Belmont, uh, Samford. They're, they're, um, they're training the next generation of Christian school teachers. And so we have relationships with those colleges. Sometimes we can't get them to come all the way down here to Florida. Um, we try to call them in about February and say, hey, do you see the sun out your window? Well, I do. It's clear blue sky and 60 degrees here. You know, come on and visit here. We'll, we'll, we'll pay for you to come on down. Just, just take a look. Because if I get somebody that's straight out of college, they're excited. They've got all the best ped pedagogy. They've got all the newest stuff. But they're also young, energetic. Um, yeah. They have great relationship with the kids. So that's how we're, we're trying to do it. Man, and there's two ways to look at that, too. Because some of the guests we've had on, there was one guy, I brought this up on another podcast, where he's like, okay, you got these... Um, the school, the head of school really should be over, like, again, like you kind of said, those few people or at least the teachers, like that's it. And not over the students, they're not doing anything with the students because you got to keep those teachers and those the staff happy. And then the staff is then going to yeah. pass that on. Yeah. He goes, well, so many times he's seen it where people will come in, these teachers are so excited. They learned in school. They're like, all these things I'm going to get to do. It's going to be yeah. great, rewarding. And they get in there. And then the head of school is like, this is exactly how you have to do your job. Here's the paperwork yeah. you have to follow. And they're like, this is not what I would, they were told. And then they, they, they bow out and they're out yeah. of there. Yeah. And so like, with, with yours, like you're saying, getting these kids right out of college, what's cool about that. Obviously there's two ways of looking at it. people going, Oh, they don't know yet really what they're doing. But two, you get to kind of, in a way, let them be oh. themselves, but tell them like, this is kind of what we look for. And you're yeah. teaching them from the beginning. Yes. So. We can mold them. And here's the thing. The beautiful thing is they don't know what they're doing. Cause I remember my first couple of years of school, I didn't, you know, um, but the beautiful thing is if they're willing and, and they also, and what we tend to do is mention with, uh, match them with a mentor uh, teacher. Mm -hmm. And so they get all of the on the job training they ever wanted and more. And so um, that, you know, we, we are able to do that sometimes. And sometimes we're able to pick up a veteran teacher out there that just, either they've been at a Christian school in another place or they have been in the public schools and they've, 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 they've run their race there and they want to run their race with us instead. So, yeah, so it's a good mix. Do you have any original teachers from 1999 still on staff? I have, I actually have a woman who works in our aftercare division who actually worked for the Lyles huh. because they were, they were, uh, they were e equine vets. And this property was the equine vet uh, clinic. She worked for them before the school existed. And she still comes to, comes to work every afternoon to do aftercare. So that's Bonnie. Um, so, and then I have uh, two, I have my office manager here and somebody in our uh, finance division who have been here since year one, no, year two and year three. Wow. So, and they were both here as year one as parents. 
So I've got a couple. I've got three that are still here, and then I've got a couple of teachers that have been here probably almost the whole time. But probably uh, they they probably came in year four of our existence. So yeah. Would you say the majority of your staff currently were after you were hired 10 years ago or are they before you were hired? That's a great question. Uh, well, because of our growth, it's after. Um, okay. Like I said, I think we had, oh, 20, 18 teachers when I got here and we've got um, 50 now. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. There you go. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, we talked about some challenges. I'd love to hear about what's going super good, something you're really proud of. If there are a few things you're proud of of the school that you want to brag about. So maybe other school leaders are like, ooh, I want to try and do the same thing they're doing. Yeah. Um, you know, I, that's a great question. I think in terms of, of what we're doing, I think having divisions, you know, as we grew, we were able to create divisions, which some schools, some leaders listening to this, like, well, that's old news. We've done that. You know, I think um, meeting with everybody together uh, as a team, you know, my division leaders work together well. In fact, I, when I say re I require it, I foster that communication. My elementary director and my upper school director and I are going to lunch tomorrow. And um, they probably are suspecting I have some sort of agenda on, the, on, on you know, with them. Um, I'm doing their evaluation separately before lunch. But then when we get to lunch, I'm going to ask him some culture questions. And I'm going to say, so, so Chelsea, Pete, how are you guys going to work together on, and I'm going to throw out several large cultural issues in terms of, you know, how are we, how are we uh, connecting our teachers from division to division? How do we remind a kindergarten teacher that she is preparing her students for our, our physics one class in ninth grade? How are we reminding our, you know, art teacher in the upper school that, you know, the the the, the kids in preschool are going to be learning some of the skills that are going to bring into her class? It, how are we how are we keeping our scope and sequence together? How are we reminding teachers that they're working in a K twelve Christian school? Um, you know, how are we doing admissions? How are we doing hiring? How are we how are we asking our our sophomore boys to take care of the locker room, hmm. which, you know, everybody's like, well, that's a good question. I'm like, yeah, we, how, 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 but how are we inviting them into ownership of the campus? How does that start in second grade? Hmm. And so, so it, it's a cultural question. So, you know, I, I actually think culture, and I, I learned this at, at Calvin College, I did the Van Lunen Fellowship, which is a wonderful um, thing for Christian school leaders to, to get involved with. but. Um, one of the presenters said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm. You can strategize all day long, but if you if you fail to deal with the culture of your school, that is staff and faculty culture, student culture, parent culture, community culture, you can plan all day long strategic initiatives, but your culture will default every time and it will it will overtake whatever you want to do. So how do we build a culture? Because you, you're going to get a culture one way or another. Either you get default culture or you get the culture that you want to shape and wrestle with and beat into submission sometimes and, and demand and grow. And so that's one thing I would say, uh, paying attention to that, using uh, your divisional leader meetings and, and times to just invite them into, challenge them, call them directly into shaping culture according to your mission, according to your vision, according to your core values. Mm. Um, so that's one thing I think that we do reasonably well. And, and the outworking of that is what we hear from the community. When people walk in the door, either as part of our school community or as people who are hearing from people in our school community, they will tell us all the time, they said, you guys are really serious about Jesus. And I'm like, <laughs> and, and I'll say, how do you know that? They're like, we hear it from your kids, we mm. hear it from your staff, we hear it from the parents that are part of your community. That makes me excited because the culture that we're attempting to engender is in some sense taking good root. And it's it's been rooted since before I got here, but we're we're not digging it out of the ground and throwing it away. We're we're trying to make the roots deeper. So I would say using using utilizing my 
direct reports to engender that culture. That's something I think is working well. Okay. I love it. I, and I wanted to uh, comment on the uh, culture eat strategy for breakfast thing that my kind of just reminded me of what I heard from one of my church leaders last week. So the church I go to down here, it's called Christ Fellowship. And it's kind of a, it's a mega church, I guess you could say for mm -hmm. South Florida. It's based in Palm Beach Gardens. So we have a campus in, of course, in Lucy and Boca and all these different places. Well, I didn't know this, but I guess our church tried to go to um, New York City with a campus because I don't know why. This was a few years ago. And he was like, we tried to go to New York City and the, <clears throat> some of the pastors were flying up every week to do a, do a sermon and do stuff. And I was like, I never remember this, like them talking about it. He goes, well, we, we, it didn't work. Like he goes, our South Florida culture that we have in our campuses, we tried to do that same culture up there and we had the strategy for it. He goes, but we didn't have the cult, did not work with the New York city culture. Mm -hmm. And he goes, it failed. So we gave all our stuff to another church and said, Hey, this is, we're going to bless God bless you. Like you do this. And he said yeah. the same thing about I asked him, hey, why don't we have a campus in Miami? Like we have Boca and all these places really pretty far south. And he goes, Miami culture is a lot like New York City yeah. culture. And he goes, yeah. our church won't, our culture will not work in Miami. And I was just like, that's so interesting that, that we have all this, like churches, 12 campuses or something. So it's got mm -hmm. strategy and all that. And we have our own culture, but it, mm -hmm. man, culture is big. And it's, it, yeah, it is. It's funny. I, I actually sat down and I, I wrote, some kind of, you know, I, I think about the year ahead and I actually wrote down some, you know, points of emphasis. What what do we want to concentrate on? And we talk about this all the time in, in, in our leadership meetings, but every point that I made, it didn't matter if it was classroom practice, if it was security and safety and supervision, if it was professionalism and confidentiality. I wrote the word culture next to every one of them. Mm every one of them is tied to the culture what what is it you're aiming for and what is it you expect and and want to grow and foster in your own so yeah and culture is hard to measure sometimes too um but i think culture is is certainly something that um we're going to focus on until until i'm 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 no longer breathing or i'm not in the seat so yeah and it's it's hard, I feel like, too, because you can easily, like, I'm sure you've noticed this, probably even maybe firsthand, you hire the wrong teacher, they get in, they kind of just mess with the culture, like, oh, this doesn't feel the same. And it's like, that's so dangerous. Like, one person can screw up the whole culture. And, yeah. yeah um, the other thing on that is, and I spoke to our, our staff in here in the gym, we had a lunch at the end of the school year just two weeks ago. And uh, I was sharing with them our master site plan, the, our growth. You know, our goal to, to, to be somewhere around 900-ish students um, in the next 10 years. And uh, I said, and before anyone says it, um, you know, there's always, there's always a couple people in the crowd that'll say, but we're going to change. We're going we're, we're gonna to be a different school. I'm like, well, guess what? We're a different school from where we were last year mm -hmm. and the year before and the year before. And that has nothing to do with numbers. You okay. can you could stay the same in terms of your numbers and never and 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 still and still change culture and so that is that's a big deal and so i think i think culture is something that regardless of whether you're growing shrinking staying the same you got to keep your eye on it because uh you could have the same exact staff year after year but they're going through different things yeah. you know that would there may be loss of parent you know there may be struggle with children. They may be struggling with with other things. The same people are going to produce a different result over time if you if you're if you're not aware of it. So I think I think culture changes. It's more a function of time than it is a function of size. Um, and so that's something we got we got to pay attention to. And I mentioned this yesterday on one of the podcast recordings. So it'll air later this year too. But uh, I said. Uh, and I related this back to church because this is what we always you know, taught in church is the gospel never changes, but the way we do church will always change. And I know it's the same thing for schools as well. It's like we're, the gospel is never going to change. We're still going to know Jesus is still awesome. We love him. He died for us, all that. But the way we're going to do school is going to have to change to keep up with the times yeah. and keep like, being relatable to these kids. Yeah. Yeah. Gen Z is a lot different than Gen X, than Baby Boomer. Yep. You have to pay attention to that. Yeah. But you also don't want to, um, yeah, throw out 
the gospel because yeah the gospel doesn't change you know jesus is the same yesterday today and forever says hebrews so yeah we that's why your culture has to be grounded in your mission your vision your core values and that's and that can be hard i know i would talk to my my mom and dad about that you know they're uh they're in their 60s now and so i'm like talking with them about oh this is what's going on right now in, in the culture and this thing and they're like well, you know, it's not like what it was when we were younger. And I know it's like harder, I think, for the older generation to to change. Like they're more, I hate what I say in this, like stuck in their ways, which is I know one of the things that happens, you know. You're going to say that about us one of these days. I know. I, one day they're, I'm going to have to say about my, the, people are going to say it about me. And I'm going to be like, yes. no, no. But <laughs> I know that that's, that's hard because there's different things that come up and go, well, we didn't do that. Or we didn't, you know, do that when we were growing up and we turned out fine and all that mm-hmm. stuff. It's like, but mm-hmm. just trying to keep up. That can be hard. I know there's the things I know when one kid, this is years ago, this is back when I was a youth pastor in Alaska mm-hmm. and the kid came with me and he's like, Hey, are you on IG? Are you on Instagram? You know? And I was like, yeah, I said, I'm not on there very much. I'm on Facebook more. And he's like, Oh, pastor Mitchell. He goes, Facebook's for <laughs> old people. And I looked and I was like, I'm 25 years old, kid. I'm 24, 25 years old. I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Um, that's when I was yeah. first told I was old. Oh yeah. Yep. It'll happen more and more. <laughs> uh, well, as we uh, kind of typically wrap up the podcast, I always love to end with my, my, one of my favorite questions is giving you a chance to give a piece of wisdom or advice for any of the school leaders listening in that you'd be like, man, I want to share this one with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, it, I don't know if I have anything original to share. I, I, I think in my journey, I have, discovered a couple of things just personally one is that i have i decided at some point in my my career to to not allow myself to become complacent um you know i had done that uh, about 11 years into my career and uh, uh god shook me in a way that that he needed to and i literally um have have committed to not being complacent and so that that lack of complacency some people would call it drive i don't want to call it drive or ambition i would call it more a, a desire not to settle um i think that that god is a redeeming god and he's constantly redeeming things and people and uh he doesn't stop and so i feel like that's what he's called me to is uh regular constant improvement regular constant renewal um, so that's one thing. The the second is that uh, as a recovering perfectionist, I've got to give myself uh, some grace. And, you know, I have three children, uh, 12 and under. Um, they deserve my time. I, I can't allow my job to become my idol. Um, so I have to, I have to create some balance uh, with that, give my wife the time, give my children the time. Um, and three, I don't do this alone. And so it's a wonderful thing, not just to have a team here, but to have colleagues, maybe some of whom are listening right now, um, that, that are smarter than me, are wiser than me, have done things before I do. And man, my mentor has told me over and over again, he said, his best ideas are never his original ones. Mm. He always gets his best ideas from listening to other people. And I've thought that myself. I'm like, you know, there is nothing new under the sun. I think the writer of Ecclesiastes reminds us in this, I think, yeah, that's me. I mean, I'm a leader. There's plenty of leadership books that are out there that are great. There's plenty of, of people that have done things before me. Uh, I am not arrogant enough to think that I've, I'm, I'm inventing the wheel. So I love listening to colleagues' ideas, and I'm hoping that maybe one person has heard something that you and I have talked about. They'll say, ah, that's a great idea, and that will be a blessing to me, and I won't even know it until, until I'm in glory. That, that somebody benefited from our conversation today. So yeah. I, I do believe that collegiality is something that um, that you've got to cultivate. And if you don't have it, go find it. Mm, I love this. And I hope so too, because I listen to podcasts every day and I learn a lot from podcasts. And I've just started this past, this sounds crazy, just in the last week, uh, tweeting more on Twitter. So I know you're like, Twitter, Uh-oh. what the heck? And <laughs> what I've been doing with it, this is my whole thinking is anytime I have like one of those, that's a really good idea or that's a really good quote or whatever, I just go and I tweet it so that I can go back. Even if nobody sees it, it doesn't really matter actually. Like I go back and I could make a video on that comment or I can just mm-hmm. remember these quotes. So I was like, I'm using Twitter kind of as like my notebook in a way. Yeah. 
And yeah. the, the one you said earlier, I'm going to tweet that one later as the, as the um, culture, culture eats uh, strategy for right. breakfast. I'm going to yeah. tweet it because that's very good. And it's uh, yeah. good content. I wish I could tell you who said that. It wasn't me, but it was a great quote. So I, See, I can't remember people. Uh, I can't remember people's names for quotes either. I'll hear something and and I feel bad because I want to give people the, you know, like, hey, this is yours, you know, right. but like you said, nothing new under the sun. Who is, maybe somebody else has already said this a hundred yeah. years ago. So, <laughs> uh, but I've, Luke, I loved, uh, I've uh, loved our chat. I love what you're doing there. You've grown that school with uh, with an amazing team behind you and wishing you guys nothing but the best as you hopefully maybe even just double here in the next few years to get to a thousand with new buildings and all that stuff you guys are working on. So keep doing what you're doing. And I'm a big fan of you guys three hours south of you. So keep doing what you're doing. Hey, thanks, Mitchell. I really appreciate it. Well, another huge shout out and a thank you to Luke for taking time and being on the podcast today. I love this chat today. I learned a ton from him and I'm hoping you guys did as well. I'm wishing Luke and his school nothing but the best as they continue to grow and educate the next generation there in Marion County and Ocala, Florida, of course. So as always, I'm hoping you guys can take at least one and maybe even two things from today's episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. There's some really good content in this one. If you need to, you can always rewind, listen to it again. And if you guys are struggling to grow enrollment or find ways to connect with your families, man, I want to hear from you. Check us out online, schoolsuccessmakers.com. That's schoolsuccessmakers.com. I love working with schools and helping them grow their enrollment because when you grow your enrollment, you're able to have more funds, which means you can pay your teachers more. You can add different programs to your school. It opens up a lot of doors, and I love being able to help schools do exactly that. But maybe you're into Facebook. I would love to see you in our private Facebook community called School Success Makers. So go over there to Facebook, search it. It's a private Facebook group just for school leaders, and I'd love to personally see you in there. We'll be here next week with another amazing guest on the School Success Podcast. We'll see you then.